Well, those poor Pharisees, those poor Sadducees, those poor Herodians, they wanted so badly to trip Jesus up with words, to paint him into a corner, to bring uh, scripture and, and the tradition to bear and to have him somehow uh, trip himself up, misstep, something that would offend the people, something that would show him to not know what he was talking about, anything. And time after time after time, they failed. They just flat out failed. They would come and they would set their traps. And by the time the, the encounter was over, they were limping off, with, caught in the trap themselves. <laughs> because the wisdom of Jesus. Uh, nobody knows the word of God better than the one who wrote it, right? So <laughs> the wisdom of Jesus uh, just could not be entrapped by them. And they were trying to stop him. They wanted to put him down. They wanted to rub him under their feet. They wanted him to be a footnote in history and perhaps even forgotten in history. And we know that that did not happen. There are many attempts to silence him and get rid of him and eliminate him and make him invisible only became stages upon which he proclaimed his truth. And it is still being proclaimed. So 2,000 years later, we're still talking about how he defeated these guys with wisdom. So it totally backfired. And, I, and I, you know, I can see them coming each time. And inside they're smiling, almost giddy. We got him this time. We got an argument, man, he can't do anything with this one. And then, but they're coming with their, their faces of sophistication and acting like they want to engage him only to have the whole thing blow up in their faces. Well, in our text today, we see yet one more person coming to engage Jesus in conversation about these sorts of things. But this guy, he's a scribe, and he actually comes with respect. He's been watching all of this going on, and he has heard how wisely Jesus has answered the questions how he has disputed with these religious leaders. And, and so now he's coming and perhaps part of him wants to trip Jesus up. Part of him certainly is saying, I'd like to talk to this man because this man is wise. And so let's read about that in Mark chapter 12 and beginning verse 28. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he had answered them well, asked him which commandment is the most important of all. Jesus answered, the most important is here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, is much more than all the whole burnt off offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. <laughs> and so this guy, this guy's friends have been put down by Jesus again and again and again. And so now he comes to Jesus and his friends are watching. They're probably thinking, oh, he'll get them. He'll get them. And the scribe was an expert in the law, um, a lawyer <laughs> in the, in the uh, law of Moses sense. 
And, uh, and the man winds up saying, teacher, you've answered well. And the man is excited. He's excited that Jesus has answered well. Um, the thing that he comes to Jesus with, this question, which is the greatest commandment? That was a common sort of, uh, a, a common sort of uh, discussion that went on among the Jews back in those days. The Jewish scholars had discerned that when you look at all of the things that are said in Genesis to Deuteronomy, the things that are cast as laws, rules, regulations, uh, things that are forbidden and, and whatnot, there are 613 of them. And so it turned into this thing, well, which one do you think is most important? Uh, this is the one I think is most important. And there even from what I read, and let me see, uh, let me get to my first slide here. Um, people would champion certain sins uh, as, or violate certain commandments as being the most important commandment. So I sort of picture that as, you know, people will talk about, well, I'm team so-and-so, or I'm team this, or I'm team that. And that's kind of how I started picturing this. And so here they are, you got team idolatry, idolatry is number one, or murder, or covetousness, or white hair and a sore, because there is a law about that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, skin disease and what happens if the hair is turned white and has to do with ceremonial uncleanness and, and stuff like that. Uh, but you know, oh, we're number one. Our, our commandment is the greatest commandment of all. And um, that's not what, what Jesus came up with. In fact, what Jesus said, and he was quoting, uh, first of all, from Deuteronomy chapter six, verses four and five, and what's known as the Shema. Shema is the first Hebrew word in the verse. It's the word here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That was something that Jews recited every day of their lives, morning and evening, twice a day. So when he utters those words, these people started their day saying those words and their ears probably perk up. And then the other one is from Leviticus 19, 18, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so what Jesus has done here is he's, he's summarized the entire law. In fact, Matthew's account of this uh, tells us that Jesus went on to say that on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And so let's take a look at this. We have uh, the first tablet of the law. If we, uh, if we break it down the way Jesus has, you know, we don't, I don't think we know how many commandments were on each tablet. You would think five and five. But the first four commandments, thou shalt have no other gods. And I summarize these, of course, they're very lengthy. Thou shalt make no idols. Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain and keep the Sabbath day holy. Those all relate to our response to God. And then the other six commandments, honor thy father and thy mother, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. Those all have to do with how we treat other people. And so when Jesus says, love, the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's that side of the law. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's that side of the law. And, uh, oh, I thought I had another verse on there. Well, we're going there. Uh, so I'll leave that one up for now. <laughs> but that was uh, in, in Matthew 2240 is, is where Matthew's account of this is. And Jesus says in that verse, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And so this is a summary statement of the, law of, of the law of God. And the scribe, he's elated. He's elated with this answer. I, he, he seems happy to me to be hearing this. Uh, the scribe said to him, you're right, teacher. You've truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. Yes, yes. 
to wholeheartedly, I wholeheartedly agree. Love him with all your heart, all the understanding, all the strength. Notice that's not exactly the same words Jesus said. Jesus doesn't say the exact same words that are in Deuteronomy. He adds one. And, um, and then if you take Matthew's version, uh, the point there is not to, to go at what does it mean to love God with all your heart? What does it mean to love God with all your soul? I mean, you can do that. But what that is, it's like an idiom that means with everything that you are. So with your whole being, body, soul, spirit, you know, we could say everything that you are, love the Lord your God. And so this guy comes and, and he quotes it the way uh, the, the rabbis had a number of different ways they dealt, they quoted that verse. And he comes with one of those. It says, and to love your neighbor as yourself, it, that's much more than the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And he's saying that in front of his friends who are the keepers of the gate <laughs> to the law the, of the burnt offerings and the sacrifices. To them, the ritual aspect of the law uh, is everything. And to come and say there's something more important than that, because they're really hung up in the, the religion of the thing. And the scribe understands the heart of the thing. And, you know, in, in fact, uh, well, we'll get to that later. No, we'll get to it right now. <laughs> I wrote a lot of stuff on my notes and confused myself. So, uh, but um, uh, this, the scribe, uh, 1 Samuel 15, 22 says, has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And so these religious leaders should know. Yeah, the scribe is right. Yeah, Jesus is right. <laughs> and, and then Hosea 6, 6 where the Lord is quoted as saying, for I desire mercy and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And so this is not an unusual thing. This is a very biblical thing Jesus is saying. He's quoting scripture and the scribe has replied with a very biblical response. So there's a good thing going on here. And, um, and, and so Jesus says, Jesus says, you're not far from the kingdom of God. He doesn't say you're in. He doesn't say you're there. But you're not far. And we want to consider this morning as we go through this text, the step that's missing in this scribe that would move him from close to the kingdom to in the kingdom. Um, but that being said after that it says no one dared to ask him any more questions i mean these religious leaders are like what are we going to do now one of our guys just <laughs> high-fived jesus on on his answer to the question <laughs> what are we going to do now and so off they go in final defeat um, we see in this text the wisdom of Jesus once again, and we see that wisdom being recognized by an unlikely figure, a scribe, um, at which says to me, you never know who's going to hear and believe. And sometimes we want to peg people and say, oh man, there's no way. <laughs> I don't even want to try. That's going to be thrown back in my face so hard from that person. But you don't know what's going on in that person's head, what's going on in that person's life, their heart. And if they do throw it back in your face, okay. Maybe you got persecuted for Jesus' sake. But maybe they're at the right time to hear the truth about the Lord. Um, the scribe's probably hanging out with all these guys while they're plotting to go and trip Jesus up. And so he finally steps up. And by the time he steps up, he's heard enough to know uh, maybe we can't trip this guy up. 
but you don't know that looking at him standing there and whatever his the scribe the garb of a scribe was and all the stuff that set him apart as a scribe and yet look at how he responded we just never know who might respond well to the truth this morning as we uh, go a little deeper into this passage we're going to focus on the words of Jesus in here and um, what once again three points the gospel is what we want to look at and we want to look at three points to the gospel and um, I'd like to give you a, a memorable memorable visual nutshell the essentials of the gospel because sometimes when the heat is on you're in a moment an opportunity comes up you forget everything right <laughs> and and so uh, maybe this visual will help in those moments to at least remember the basics and um, I'd like to present this in the form of a triangle so that's why we have the geometry lesson going on there we're going back to geometry class to look at the gospel um, geometry class and we're going to look at three sides to the uh, the gospel triangle <laughs> so there's our triangle now of course triangles have three sides and I picked uh, an isosceles triangle where all the sides are equal because there is nothing more important in here than anything else. It's, it's, it's all part of it. And we're going to label our sides A, B, and C because in a geometry lesson you'd have point A, B, and C but we're, we're looking at, at the sides of the triangle and you also have side A, B, and C. So we have side A that's our first side and that's going to bring us our first point God has a standard God has a standard and I've I've made this all rhythmic so we have ABC we have rhythm we have music we have my gal who could ask for anything more now. Uh, and uh, <laughs> And uh, God has a standard. And what is that standard? That standard is his law. His law is his standard. It's what man is accountable to. And Jesus has summed up the law for us in this text before us this morning. Uh, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And by the way, make sure the God you're loving is the right God, the one God, the God who is one. Not many options. Okay, well, I like this God over here in this religion, so I will love that God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and I'll be obeying the law. No, because tied up in it is the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. He is one. And so love the one true God with every aspect of your being that's how we could paraphrase that love the one true God with every aspect of your being and the second part of the law is you naturally do what's best for you do that for others love your neighbor as yourself now over the years I've heard what I consider to be very bad teaching on that verse by some people that I really like who I don't need to go naming names or anything but they take this, a psychological uh, viewpoint on love your neighbor as yourself and say see you can't love your neighbor if you don't love yourself and so therefore love yourself get your self-esteem right and everything and then you'll be able to love your neighbor properly well, there may be some psychological truth in that. If you walk around hating yourself or, or in a total sense of negativity, you're not in a good position to, to reach out to other people. I understand that, but that's not what Jesus is saying. He's, he's saying you already love yourself. 
I mean, you brush your teeth so you won't have to go to a dentist and inflict pain on yourself. You eat so you won't die of starvation. You clothe yourself. You, you find a way to put a roof over your head. You earn a living so you've got some money to provide for yourself. You, you seek out friends who are nice to you. <laughs> And you, you love yourself. You take care of yourself. Even people who don't look like they take care of themselves, to some degree, are taking care of themselves. Don't just think of yourself. Treat others the way you would treat yourself. You naturally do what's best for you. Do that for others. So, Jesus is... is uh, summing the law up in those two things. Um, now, people have all kinds of ideas about love. This is, you know, love God, love people. Okay, <laughs> what does that say to you? It depends on what you think love is. Because, you know, you, you've seen the person who's mistreating his girlfriend or his wife or whatever, and she's finally had enough and she's gonna leave him, and what does he do? Oh, come on, baby, I can be better, I can change, don't leave, I love you, I love you. That's a very twisted definition of love. It's really a self-love. It's if you leave me, I'm gonna be miserable, so don't leave me so I won't be miserable. <laughs> it's loving self. The word that's used here is the verbal form of agape, agapao. And agape is a selfless love, generally. And so it's, it's a love that gives. And Jesus is saying, give unto others what you would want to receive from them. Uh, give everything of yourself to the Lord, to the one true God. So when we think of obeying God, you know, we, we define love sometimes as meeting other people's needs. Well, God doesn't have any needs, so we don't go meeting God's needs. We don't love him that way. But God has his will. To go against his will is like a slap in the face. It's like a rejection. Love is not a rejection. Love is an acceptance and so to walk in the will of God, to obey the will of God uh, for him, not just for what we get out of it. People will say, things go better with God, and they do, but that's not our motivation, because that motivation is love for me. I'm gonna do this as long as it works for me. That kind of mentality causes some people to say, this isn't working for me anymore. This is getting too hard. God's not coming through for me the way I've been told he would. Well, maybe God's letting you go through the fire because he's got something to teach you. Maybe he's letting you go through the fire because of the testimony you can have. But if all you're in, in it with God for is because he makes you, he, he meets your needs or makes you feel better, makes you happy, things go better with God or something like that, when God starts putting you through the fire, which he will, you might, you might bolt. But to love him, to obey his will for him because of who he is. Uh, let your whole being adore him, exalt him, praise him, spend time with him, for him, for him. That's the command to love the Lord your God with everything that you are. And then loving your neighbor, the best guide for that might be the golden rule, Matthew 7, 12. And, uh, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, that idea turns up in a lot of religions around the world. Some people say, oh, Jesus stole that from somebody else. But it's also there in Leviticus 19.18, which predates all those other religions, like Confucius said something like that, and Buddha said something like that. But they were all hundreds of years after Leviticus. And another thing, too, is often when that turns up, if not all the time, 
it turns up it's like an ethical reciprocity kind of thing. Uh, if you want people to treat you nicely, then you treat them nicely. And that's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying, treat people the way you want to be treated, regardless of the response you get back. So it's not, it, it's not do unto others so they will do unto you. And it's not like the bumper sticker that used to be at the gas station down on the corner when I was a kid where we would go buy candy all the time. It's not do unto others before they do unto you. And I think the bumper sticker maybe had Yosemite Sam there with a couple of pistols in his hand or something. <laughs> it's not that. It's do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Good things you want from others, give those good things to others, whether they give them back or not. That, that's tough standard. But it is God's standard. God has a standard. And so now we move to side B, the next part of the gospel. God has a standard. And then we go come to side B. And side B is we have a problem. <laughs> we have a problem. Our problem is we stink at keeping God's standard. We fail all the time. All means all. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. All. So if you ever miss that anywhere along the way, you're no longer loving him with all. You're loving him with all less a second here and a second there and um, and that's the best we would do nobody is ever actually that good at it but if we were that good at it we would still fail because we've fallen short of all more often we we have long periods of time where we suddenly realize that we're s selfishly loving ourselves <laughs> in the place of God and so uh, we, we fail at that, and as means as. Love your neighbor as yourself. Not love your neighbor better than other people love your neighbor so you'll have a good testimony. That's good, but it falls short of the law. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is going to be total love all the time for God. I'm not just talking about feeling the emotions of it and everything, talking about our actions toward God, our actions that reflect on God, total love totally all the time, and total love totally all the time for our neighbors. That's the standard, and we fall short of that. Uh, have, you, have you loved God with all you are. Have you never once slipped up? Have you always shown love for God with everything that you have? Um, you don't have to answer that. I know the answer. Uh, have you loved your neighbor as yourself? Always. Not selfish even once. You say, well, even once. That, that, seems, that seems extreme. Is that your standard you're putting on that, Mark? Well, Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. James 2.10. So even once means that uh, we have failed. One failure equals total failure. Isn't that something? You say, well, how can that be fair? Well, first of all, God doesn't have to be fair. I mean, God created this world. God we, we messed it up, so God could have just written us off, but God didn't write us up, off. God engaged us and gave us a way out of the situation that we had done, and he gave us a standard, and we blow the standard, and so God has given us a solution, and we're going to get to that next, side C. But, um, you know, God is God, and there are lots of things in this world where you only get one shot at it. And one mess up is a total mess up. 
for instance, I think I've told the story before about uh, my first job after high school, my first non-fast food job. <laughs> I, 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 always, I always cringe when I say that, though, because there are a lot of people my age who are working fast food. It's not something to put down, but when you're, when you're a kid and, you're, and you're, you're thinking college and your career and stuff like that, you're not thinking of staying there. So my first job beyond that was in a bank, and uh, one of the things I had to do, and I did it almost nightly, was to go up on the roof of the bank where the helicopter would come and drop off checks from all of our branches that we would then, um, we would then process and you know divide them up and they go off to the correct federal reserve branches and um and it was a 21 story building and so uh up on the roof we would go now you could go up there was a little like wall there you could stay behind the wall which we did when the helicopter was coming down just just for safety's sake there's a helicopter landing pad out there but sometimes we get up there early, and so we just sit on the edge. And one time I was getting up from sitting on, we'd hang our feet over the side of this building. And one time when I was getting up from sitting on the edge, it did have a, a lip. So there was like a ridge going around, and then it went down onto the, the roof itself. So your backside was kind of like wedged into that little curve there. It wasn't like you were sitting on just a flat edge. That would have been... <laughs> That would have been pretty bad, but it was pretty bad anyway. But one time when I got up from that, because it was really cool, you could see, oh, here comes the helicopter. You see them coming across the horizon, heading for the building. And uh, so, you know, we got up to go get behind the wall where we're supposed to be when the helicopter's landing on the pad. And there were lightning rods along the edge of the building. And when I stood up and, and we were talking and stuff, um, I bumped the lightning rod and I looked down and it was right in between my feet and and it was inches from the edge and if I had tripped on that the wrong way I would have had one chance one mistake would have been total failure total failure in that situation and uh, I'm really glad it didn't happen uh, when I was out in Colorado back uh, when I was very young and we went up on Pikes Peak and we were looking around and my friend Mike was uh, got a little too close to the edge uh, at the at the overlook and he actually started whoa and I reached out and grabbed his arm I saved his life I think that was one error would have been total failure in that situation I mean these things happen in a lot of ways in life someone can live a squeaky clean life morally and then mess up one time have an evening with somebody who has AIDS and there you go one mistake total failure so these things happen in the natural world as well um, but uh, with the law the law is to be obeyed entirely, which means we are to love the Lord our God with all we are, all the time, and we're to love our neighbors as ourselves all the time. If we miss at one point, we fail at the whole thing. But of course, we do miss way more than once, don't we? Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Paul in Romans 7, talking about the things I want to do, I don't do. And he's talking morally related to walking with God. The things I don't want to do, in other words, sin, I do. And, you know, it's, it's who we are. We fight this battle. Unless we've just totally given up and say there is no God and ignore God and go live entirely for ourselves. But anything from that up to a single failure fails the standard. And so we do have a problem. I don't have it up there anymore. We, but we do, we do have a problem. 
And so the problem is we fail at God's standard. So God has a standard, the law. We have a problem, our sin. And then side C, side C is that there's a solution. God has a standard, we have a problem, there's a solution. There's a solution. These, uh, these leaders who had rejected Jesus, it meant that they had missed the solution. And so we find Jesus saying, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for, and I kind of put in blue there, you neither enter yourselves, enter the kingdom yourselves, nor allow those who would enter to go in. Matthew 23, 13. But this, this scribe, the scribe isn't in the kingdom, but Jesus isn't talking to him like that. And so we see there in verse 34, when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. You're not far, but you're not there, but you're not far. Who are the ones that are there? What's the step? The step, I have three verses. It's all about Jesus. To all who did receive him, Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, John 1.12. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Also talking about Jesus in context. Acts 4.12. Please forgive the lack of a closed parenthesis. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. That's as plain as day. 1 John 5, 11 and 12. It is about Jesus. It's about the response to Jesus. This scribe had another step. He understood the law. The next step is to realize his failure of it and embrace the one who is the solution, Jesus. And in that perspective, before Jesus had gone to the cross, he as a Jew would have embraced Jesus by embracing him as his Messiah, the one that had been promised, the one that the Father sent, our King, uh, and, uh, and, and to receive him in that way. Apparently he didn't do that. We aren't told. Maybe, maybe after the conversation was over, he went back and said, you know, I think you're the Messiah. Uh, and uh, we, we don't know. We won't know till we get to heaven. But we do know that just having a theological grasp of things gets you close, but it doesn't get you in. Getting in is all about receiving the one who can take you in. And that's Jesus. So, you know, that that is the gospel in a nutshell. It's really simple. God has a standard. God has a standard. And that standard is uh, his law. God has a standard. We have a problem. We disobey. We fail. We sin. But there's a solution. And the solution is in the one who came and lived the law perfectly, never failed in even one place, so never had sin, was born of a virgin, had no original sin to inherit, lived perfect life, had no practical sin that he committed in his life, was everything, he wasn't a created being, he's existed from eternity past, he's one with the Father and the Spirit, but the man who came, he came in the form of a man who was everything that man was created to be until we fell, until we fell. And he lived it perfectly. And then he who had inherited 
no sin, committed no sin, and so was deserving of no death, died. Died in our place. That he would pay for our sins. And that's the solution. Uh, so, when I was at a uh, Christian college, when I first started my theological studies, I went to a particular college for one year, and we were doing the Old Testament, Old Testament survey. And the teacher had us uh, to help us remember the two and a half tribes that did not go across the Jordan. When Israel went into the land, there were two and a half tribes that said, hey, we like it here on the eastern side of the Jordan. Uh, can we just stay here? And then the other tribes went on into the land. And those tribes were Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, the half-tribe of Manasseh. You know how I remember that? Because that prof said to us, let's all say together, Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh. Again, Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh. Again, Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh. We did that like 10 times. I not only got it right on the test, but I've never forgotten. And so here's what I would like us to do for just, just a few times. God has a standard. We have a problem. There's a solution. Would you feel comfortable just saying that together? God has a standard. We have a problem. There's a solution. God has a standard. We have a problem. There's a solution. God has a standard. We have a problem. There's a solution. God has a standard. We have a problem. There's a solution. Now, can you close your eyes and say it without me? <laughs> God has a standard. We have a problem. There's a solution. Okay, hopefully, hopefully you'll never forget that. <laughs> The standard is the law. The problem is our sin. The solution is Jesus. That's rhythmic too. Those are all two syllables. So <laughs> the law, our sin, Jesus. So um, respecting him is not enough. Being impressed with him is not enough. Receiving him is the way, and it is the only way, as we see it unfold in the New Testament. Okay, Let's pray. Lord, we praise you and thank you for this gift you have given us. Uh, we were the ones who failed you, and it's not beholden upon you to provide any way out for us for what we have done to ourselves. And yet, you have graciously shown us mercy and provided the way of salvation through the work of your Son on the cross that we might have that salvation through faith in him. Lord, we thank you so much for that. And I pray that these things would uh, be etched in our minds, not only that we might appreciate them as we go along and ponder them uh, for the rest of our lives, but Lord, that we might uh, have them uh, in our minds ready to share when opportunities come up. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.